Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of the Anything Wrestling Podcast. Thank you once again for joining us. This is actually a very unique episode. It's actually the very first official quarantine episode of the AWP series uh, because, as everybody knows of what's going on around the world with the whole coronavirus, uh, we are taking measures to ensure that we're all staying safe and recording the podcast at the same time. On behalf of myself, Dan, the man, and the commission, we hope that everybody out there is staying safe, uh, stay indoors, and uh, yeah, how you guys doing? Good. Kamish? Uh, I'm, doing, I'm doing good. Before we get into it, I want to get your guys' thoughts. You know, we were going into this WrestleMania with kind of a unique feel because we knew for a fact it was going to be indoors, no audience, it's not in a big stadium, it's in the Performance Center, everything is a little bit more grounded. How did you guys feel when... Uh, when, you know, they said a WrestleMania, Performance Center, you know, because of what's going on around the world. How did you guys take it? I, I thought that it was um, questionable. <laughs> I, I did not necessarily support the idea of doing it uh, the way that they did originally. Right. Like, if we're being, if we're being fair, the, the whole concept of, like, hey, we're still doing it. We want to, like, please the fans around the world literally now that cannot even be here I, it, it felt for a unique situation like some it, it, it makes a big impact on particular matches to not have anyone there and and cheer or boo or or just give the all-out feel and like i i think i read somewhere for like uh jericho was watching uh WrestleMania, and he literally just muted the TV. Oh, wow. Because it made no sense to, like, listen, I guess, like, because you could hear the competitors, the, the audio of, like, the uh, announce team is way louder than normal. Yeah. So it's like, oh, the only time you really need audio was for the Boneyard match and for the, uh, the Funhouse match. Yeah, the audio mixing was was off. Well, I mean, honestly, like, and let me know if you guys agree or disagree. I felt like not having an audience kind of added a flavor to a few of the matches. Example, Seth Rollins versus Kevin Owens. You know, the parts where Seth goes, hey, Kevin, I told you when the lights are the brightest, I'm a god. And then when Kevin has his comeback, he's like, come on, Seth. Come on, God. You know, he's mocking him, and I just thought it added this, this like, humor to the match, you know, to kind of break the ice. What did you guys think? You know, if they had to, that's, I mean, I hope not, but let, let's just say for a second, if the next pay-per-view or next year's Mania was going to be in, in the same conditions, no fans, would you guys be okay with it, or would it be like, oh, this is going to be unbearable again? It, it, like, it, like I said, so for some particular things that make sense, other parts, you're, you're kind of like that, where you're like, all right, you kind of see the better interaction of what's going to happen, and then other matches, you're just like, all right, it's just like noise now. I, I've, I've found that for the mo that, that more often than not, this whole no audience thing has been kind of killing the vibe. Because um, even the, the Raws and Smackdowns, it just it feels like there's something missing. Um, yeah. I would I, I, I would never go out of my way to do an entire show without a crowd again if I could avoid it. Interesting. Like, okay, let me just add this in so we can jump into the review. When you have someone who just signs a contract, they make their big, impactful entrance, the crowd makes up for that, like, impact. Yeah. And it's like, oh... You had Ciampa and Gargano and Triple H in the ring. You have this promo tape playing, and then that's it. Yeah. You have no reaction from nobody. It's just like, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you don't you don't get any sort of gauge as to how the audience feels about somebody if you don't have that audience. <laughs> I mean, to just quickly bring this up, you know, I feel like bringing CM Punk back now 
would really kill that comeback because you can only imagine the pop that awaits the guy once he decides for the first time to step back into a, an arena or a stadium. And to not have an audience, it would be like you hear that cult of personality hit, but there's no pops, there's no cheering, there's no noise, and it's like, uh, something is missing here, you know? So, yeah, I, I, I understand where you guys are coming from. So, we got about... 16 matches to break down. We got two nights of action to do it. So, Kamish, let's kick off night one. Um, so, to kick off night one, uh, straight into the main show, we start with the uh, inaugural women's tag team championship match between the Kabuki Warriors versus uh, Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross. Um, First, congrats to the new ch tag champs of Bliss and Cross. Um, I like the match personally. I, I, I thought it was, it was great. It was the, the entertainment factor was there. You could see like the traditional tag team essence of like you know you know you have the heels winning. You want the baby face to tag in the partner. You know the build up, all that going. Um, I like how the women's tag division kind of is right now, but I think I've mentioned this a few times where if we had different setup of teams on both shows, it would equally fair out unless these tag championships are now defended on all three platforms. I, I don't know how you guys feel. I don't know if they have enough groups to do something like that where each, each show has an entire division. Um, because I think I I had heard that they they might be splitting up Kabuki Warriors now possibly. Um, then you got Fire and Desire just uh, got separated because of that whole angle. Um, you're you're thinning out your your women's tag division right now. As for the match itself, I uh, this is one, definitely one of those matches that would have would have uh, been better received if you'd had an audience. Because I think that uh, Bliss and Cross definitely deserved to pick up the win here. And I think that the audience would have loved to have seen that. Yeah, definitely agreed. Um, I obviously went into this thing uh, rooting for Bliss and Nikki. I think that they work great as a team. Kabuki Warriors, I just feel like from day one, it just it hasn't worked out. Once again, another case of just slapping two people together and going, okay, this should have worked. Um, keeping in mind that Paige used to be their manager and that fizzled out relatively quick before it even really got started. Um, this was, I will just attest or, you know, go against one thing that you said, Dan. Um, having a crowd would have been great, but I think that these four women did a great job of sort of filling in the environment with all the, you know, little side comments and all the screaming and, you know, Asuka speaking Japanese, you know, just incoherently. I just thought that it added a new dynamic to the match. Um, obviously, in an ideal world, we would all want, you know, um, crowd in there. But it's like, if we have to work with what we got, you know, I think, that, I think that they did a good job of sort of, you know, putting color to, you know, kind of a black and white, if you will. I was just going to say, I just want to clear. I don't, I don't think that the match was bad. And I don't think the match itself suffered from not having a crowd. Yeah. But I think that part of the magic of WrestleMania specifically, and really those big moments, those uh, reaching the pinnacle of the mountain moments, uh, are they, they purely benefit from having an audience. So that was really, I was saying the conclusion, I think, just suffered a little bit from it. But no, I thought that the, the women did fine. Yeah, so, yeah, for sure. So do you feel like, because like it, it, it kind of lessens their mania moment, at this rate because of what's going on? Yeah, and I think that happened several times over the course of these two days. It, 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 that, that's my big, my biggest disappointment with how this all, this all panned out. I'm not mad with the results. I'm mad with the, the fact that some of these people got their moment but didn't get to experience it uh, the, to, to the most. Like the last match. Correct. Well, I mean, at this point, it's, you know, you deal with the cards that you're dealt with. But, uh, Kamish, to answer your question, um, women's division, all three platforms, yes. But to go back to Dan's point, a lot of your tag teams have, we, 
Uh, I mean, we are insinuating here, but it's like he said, fire and desire. It's pretty safe to assume as split. Kabuki warriors, eh, I don't even think there's much to do there. Um, if we can start building a solid foundation with, you know, women's tag team wrestlers, I think that would be great um, to have it all, on all three platforms. But, yeah. All right, so let's move on with the night. Uh, we have Elias uh, versus King Corbin. Um, <laughs> you almost said Booker. <laughs> Yeah, I, I hesitated, <laughs> but I, uh, so the, I I really feel like this match could have been like a pre-show match because honestly, it's like where, where's the build? Where where's the the whole thing with this going for both of them? Like, don't get me wrong, they had a decent match. I just think it could have done on the pre-show. That that's just me. I don't know how you guys feel about it. Um, I agree. I, if you had to have this match at all, um, it was it, it was okay. Um, I called I called the guitar spot. Yeah. Uh, but if if the match had to happen for some reason, it, it would have been fine to have it on on the kickoff show and have it be one of those, uh, for lack of a better term, throwaways, uh, because it was really just card filler and and uh, that's about it. Um. I'm going to demote the match, but I'm going to promote something else. I, and I think I told you guys this, I would rather have Elias and Corbin on the pre-show and have Gulak and Cesaro on the main card. Um, I told you guys the Cesaro and Gulak thing was a four-minute match, but just proof that these guys can go, even if they're on, you know, the kickoff show. Because going back to your guys' point, Elias and Corbin... um, I think I was like just tuning out during this match. It just things were happening incoherently, and all I know is a guitar got smashed over someone's head. There was a roll up and a one two three, and that was pretty much it. Nothing really to go off of. So, yeah, I'm with you guys on that. So let's just move on, and because it's uh, the Raw Women's Championship, uh, Becky Lynch defending against Shayna Baszler. I, oh man, but, I'm gonna say I, I I apologize, but really we had to have another botch win. Um, am I wrong, Kamish? By chance, do you have the 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 time uh limit of this match on you? Um, I don't, but I can pull it. Up. I can find it, and as I'm finding it, I can talk. Um, um I'll tell you this. Look, it it, it it's a match that had a lot of potential. It's a match that should have shown us a lot more. But as you guys saw with the end result, it's like, um, what the hell? It, it, it's like, I feel like we're repeating last year's horrible event of, oh, okay, eight minutes and 30 seconds. And yeah. and do you have the, the time limit for the Rhea and Charlotte match? 20 minutes and 30 seconds. Okay, you guys can probably understand what I'm trying to say. Something about a shovel. <laughs> well, not, I mean, Dan, you go ahead, because I feel like I'm speaking out of turn, and I'll, and I'll make my point afterwards. Well, I mean, my, my opinion on, on the whole thing, and I, I said this when, when we were watching it, was the, the thing to keep in mind is that this was all pre-recorded, which means that that wasn't a botched finish. That was the finish they decided to go with. So, so you, that, make, that makes it even worse. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I forgot about that. I forgot that this was pre-taped a few days before, and somewhere along the li- lines, I could have sworn I heard there was more than one taping. Yeah, like with different multiple results. scenarios, yep. So who decided to pull the trigger on this end? Dan. Who, who would make that decision? Who's the third man? John Cena, apparently. As a, as a, as a little fun fact, because um, I'm also looking at it, the, pre, the kickoff match the next night with Liv Morgan and Natty was six minutes and 25 seconds, meaning that they were only two, two minutes, minutes shy two minutes. of that match. <laughs> Did someone just say no? Um, Let me say this real quick. Yeah, okay, ahead. so here's the thing. I, 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 feel, I feel robbed with Becky's matches right now. I'm sorry, but 
but it's like we got all this built up. Like I had told you, I think in a conversation off air a while back, she's been getting the right buildups to her matches, to her stories, and then you would think, okay, she gave us the best match between her and Oscar in January. Yeah. And then we get this. Like what the? I, I feel cheated. Yeah, to go to go from eliminating everybody in the elimination chamber match to a eight to an eight eight and a half minute match for the title that ends so unceremoniously it's it's definitely a disappointment uh given the fact that uh she's still Shayna's still one of the best heels that they've got in the women's division right now and they just haven't they haven't properly utilized her since bringing her over for this I'm going to jump in here. Uh, Dan, I'm going to just address what you just said right there. I am hearing, and I don't know if this is true or if, or what the deal is, but I'm hearing that Vince actually is, pardon the pun, not all in on Shayna, feeling like she's not a legitimate, you know, like he, he's, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't have much confidence in her, is what I'm That's hearing. That's crazy old bat. Yeah. Um, my second point is that there's a reason why I asked for the, the, the time limit of each match is because you think about a match that, actually going back to your point, Kamish, had a very, very good buildup. I, I, I was, like, I was tuned in, you know, they, again, they're working with what they have, and I was, I was tuning into it, you know, the biting of the neck, Shayna going on a path of destruction, uh, destruction Becky with, you know, the chair shot to the back. I was digging it. I'm like, okay, like let you know, this is the type of match where you just have to let these two get in the ring and let them have at it. Um, but to have less than ten minutes, um, and keep in mind, she's been your champion for a year now. So if you're doing that, you're kind of getting the CM Punk treatment where you have this long ass title reign. But guess what? None of your matches are in the main event, or are, are they're not treated as the main event. Um, and honestly, like the match was good. Like, it was actually a really, like, up until the three count, it was actually a very good match, you know? Um, but the the way that it just abruptly ends, it's like, okay, um, why, Dan? Why? 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 <laughs> why? So, and, yeah. And that's my thing. It's like, you have all this, you create a good story, you have a, a good buildup, and then the money shot is I at first was under the impression that maybe they're trying to save time by shortening the matches because they have 16 matches to get through. But then I thought about it. I'm like, okay, well, Becky gets eight minutes and you know who gets 20 some odd minutes. Huh? Yeah, Blonde Cena. And the one thing I was thinking in my mind, and I'm going to go somewhere weird with this. This was the type of match where like these two needed to be you know exhausted gasping for air you know sweating makeup is all over the place but the way that they end the match it's like they're intact everything is good you know just you know catching a little breather that's it you don't get you don't get the vibe that oh these two are exhausted they've had just put on a really good match it's like eh. like if you look at edge and randy orton it's like by the end of the match they were gone like they're done they're exhausted after a 35-minute match, but these two, it's like, eh, whatever, like, just catching a little breather, you know, eh, whatever. So, it's really a shame, honestly. It's it's such a shame that Becky's been your champion for a year, and you don't, you don't even give her 10 minutes. It's it's honestly a crime. And that's why I, 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 I want to move forward, because it's like, the more I talk about it, the more disappointed I'm just going to be. Um, so, moving forward... We have the Intercontinental Championship uh, match between your current champion, Sami Zayn, versus Daniel Bryan. Um, Sami being Sami, you know, I mean, not the greatest of heels, but still pulling off what a heel does. Um, The whole thing of, like, having, what is it, the the artistic movement, is that what their group's called? Is that what it's called? I don't know. I'm not sure. They kept mentioning it, but I guess that's what like Sammy, Cesaro, and uh, Shinsuke's group is called. You know, against Daniel Bryan and Drew, and I think 
think they're trying to find like a third person for their little group. Who's the but, third uh, man? Yeah, who's the third man? <laughs> but I mean, it was a decent match. I I don't know how I still feel about Sami Zayn being the Intercontinental Champion. Like I, I feel like as a heel champion, it's not working. Maybe if he was a babyface with the title, it probably make a little more sense to me. I, I'm, Dan, how do you feel about it? Um, I, I think that the idea of Sammy being a champion is still a little, um, abstract for some of us because it's so unfamiliar. Um, I think this is a good title for him to have, and I, I think he still has some room to grow and some, some things that he can do before he drops the belt to somebody. So I don't have a problem with it. Um, I, I, do if Drew had gone over my, I gotta get my computer charging. If Drew had gone over Cesaro, I almost would have said you don't necessarily even need to get a third person to go with them because you could have just made it a thing where like, oh well, you've got Drew and he's so uh, talented and so formidable that even Cesaro and Shinsuke together are uh, are having issues, and uh, you could have you could have had it to where Daniel and Drew's talent alone makes them comparable to those other three and it would have been uh would have been compelling uh you know i in my prediction i said that i wanted daniel to walk away with the win because i just feel like with sammy they honestly have no plans they're just you know going back to what you've said before dan we're gonna throw it on the wall if it sticks we're going with it um Again, uh, going back to Kamisha's point, I don't buy Sammy as a as a heel champion. Um, maybe if he was babyface, yeah, that could be a different story. But um, I don't really see them going anywhere with this. I even sort of had the idea that if Daniel wins, you can slowly start building up, you know, like a teacher and pupil storyline between him and Drew. Like, hey, you know, I I was the one to say that there is, you know, holes in your in your you know move set in your. Uh, strategies you know why don't you put that title on the line against me you know but i mean this whole thing of grouping shinsuke cesaro and uh, sammy together it's just it's it's a waste of time you know you could do so much so much more with these three um but yeah i mean just overall the match it was okay but you know nothing particular really stands out so moving forward we got what could have been a six-man tag match was now a triple threat match for the SmackDown Championship uh, between, what was it, Jimmy Uso? Not Jay, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Jim, Jimmy, so, Kofi, so, and John. So Jimmy, yeah, Kofi and John. Um, obviously, Woods is still injured. Uh, Biggie was the odd man out. And then um, there's a lot of rumors with The Miz, whether he was sick, he's quarantined now. <laughs> Yeah. You all right there? Better than the Miz. <laughs> and then, of uh, course, you know, Jimmy decided to step up. I honestly, I love this match. I, I thought it was, I, even though I thought it could have been better if you added the other three, it, for the three of them alone, um, it was a great match. Um, I like the weird controversial ending, quote unquote. Just because it's like, all right, you have both uh, one member of the Uso Penitentiary and one member of the New Day grabbing, you know, the belts, like by that little clothes hanger, but yet John still managed to strip the belts off of it and kind of leave it like, uh, you both thought you won, but I still beat you to it at the very end. Um, I thought, like, because it's WrestleMania, you know, Again, the impact of not having a crowd, maybe you could have introduced, like, tables and chairs. It was strictly like a ladder match the whole time. But still a, a good match for WrestleMania standards. Uh, how do you guys feel? Uh, I, I liked the match. I, I think that the three guys in, in here did did really well. Um, they, they went all out, and uh, like I've heard other people's reactions... Uh, you had the moment like where Kofi chucked the ladder at Jimmy. Uh, you had the the Starship pain off the off the what is it the ring post, and they were just they were doing all kinds of stuff, and it was it was a really entertaining 
well choreographed match, and then you've got that spot at the end with the with the belts, where uh, I I kind of made the half joke that oh well two of them should fall off and they each have the belt each each have one belt and then they ch- have to chase each other to get the second one, but conceptually this kind of the same thing except you cut out the middleman. Um, I, I I didn't have a problem with it, and I think it was unique enough where it still stuck the landing. Yeah, you know, I think this is really the first match of the night with all the oohs and the ahs, you know, um, the one that really stands out first before any other match, um, I, like in regards to like, you know, timeline of the card. Um, yeah, I think just another case of no matter what situation, you know, New Day or the Usos and now John Morrison are put at, these guys could perform, they could go out there and they can have a great match. Props to all of them, you know, taking, you know, some disgusting bumps and, you know, putting their bodies on the line. But, you know, that's what you do. And even in an environment when there's no crowd to kind of give you that, you know, I think I even made a joke mid-match where I was like, this is where the, you know, this is awesome chants come in. Um, But again, when you don't have that, you find other ways to sort of substitute that in and, you know, you know, make the match exciting. So... Yeah, I enjoyed the match. Um, props to all three of the competitors. So moving on, we have the, the Monday Night Messiah, Mr. Sako Rollins, John. Yes. Uh, Seth Rollins versus uh, KO Mania 4, Kevin Owens. And what started as a regular one-on-one match, but then turned into a no DQ match since uh, your boy Seth over there pulled off some uh, no no uh, shot to the head <laughs> right there with the belt. Yeah, he's really good at getting disqualified as of late. <laughs> yeah, I thought the headshots were a boo boo thing. Now, well, why is, why is he aiming for the head? If I think they're slowly going back to headshots, but they're taking like the proper uh, safety measures to make sure that it's not really a shot to the head. It's you know that the opponent you know looks the other way when the item is coming you know to their head or they put their hands up or something. Yeah, just ask Randy. Oh Lord, oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, as far as like. The whole chemistry of the match, the whole thing of them talking shit to each other, I liked it. I I thought this was like a really good standout match for the performance center. It was like, yes, you hear like how they really feel about each other. You know, obviously, if it was in front of the crowd, you wouldn't hear it as much unless they were loud enough to pull it off. Um, like I had told you guys, if this was done originally. In Tampa, in, at the Raymond James uh, football stadium, there is a pirate ship over there. Could have utilized that when it turned into the no DQ portion of yeah. the match. But Kevin jumping off of the WrestleMania sign, I, I thought that was a good spot. I, I liked the match. Um, it was one of my favorite matches of night one. Yeah, two, two very talented guys. Uh Going steering head on into the the brutality and the physicality of the of the feud, um, the elbow drop uh, looked painful. Uh, Seth sold it really well. Uh, we made jokes about the the <laughs> ring bell hit and how it sounded like nothing like the old school No Mercy video game. Um, brought back a lot of memories. Uh, good good job by both guys. Yeah, I mean, not really much to add for me. Great match. You know, another case of these two guys, no matter what the circumstance, they can go out there, they can have a good match. Um, I don't know if maybe before this match, they kind of decided, hey, you know what, we're going to strip away every other person who was in the storyline. Because if you guys took note, um, there were no Viking Raiders or whatever they're called now. There was no Buddy Murphy, you know, Rezar wasn't there either. You know, it seems like everybody was kind of stripped away and it was just down to Seth and Kevin, which kind of leads me to believe maybe this storyline might be over at this point, but we'll have to see. Other than that, great match. Loved it. And also the the trash talking in in the middle of all of it. Great stuff. I do think that it was a good idea, that it was the right call to limit it to just these two so that we could actually focus on just them. Yes. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong, like, if the the storyline's dead, Hell, let's just go in that direction. But if it happens to continue, I kind of would like to see 
Like, at this point, like, all right, Kevin Owens is done with Seth. Let him get his hands on Buddy Murphy in a, in a match at hopefully Money in the Bank. I, I don't know if he wants to go up against, uh, uh, what's his name from AOP? Bizarre? Again, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, then, before the, the match of the night, we have Power versus Power. Big Man versus Big Man. Uh, finisher versus finisher fest. Goliath versus slightly smaller Goliath. <laughs> you have um, Goldberg defending his Universal Championship unsuccessfully to the Monster Among Men, uh, Braun Strowman. Last minute replacement, according to WWE. Um, replacing Roman Reigns, even though this was announced. Literally a week ago. Would it have been the same thing if we had saw Spear versus Spear? Instead of Spear versus Power Slam? I don't know. I think Braun... I mean, he was bound to get the Universal Championship somehow. I didn't think it would be to Goldberg. But he was the he was the next man up. How do you guys feel? The, the, the whole... The ultimate match was sort of a mess to get to. And, uh, I mean, they did what they could. They tried to make it mean something. Unfortunately, uh, all, all the things involved just kind of watered just one down. And it, It's not Braun's fault, but eh. Do you think Braun is a victim of circumstance because of that, then? Well, I mean, you've got... This, this and the, the WWE Championship match are literally cookie cutter. Like, it's the same match with different people. Um, except for the fact that Brock and Drew went two minutes longer. Um, I just, I don't think that this was an impressive match. I don't think it really proved anything. All, all it showed is that, oh, look, Braun can take some spears, which we knew from his matches with Roman. So... <laughs> Um, I think that this whole Goldberg situation is a victim of a plan A, which got turned into a plan B, which then got turned into plan C. I think I told you guys they didn't want originally Roman taking the title off of The Fiend, so they gave it to Goldberg, hoping that if Roman took it off of Goldberg, it would ease, you know, um, the tension between Roman and the crowd. And then at the last minute, hey, thing, you know, because of the whole leukemia thing with Roman, he's got to, you know, stay, you know, away. Um, and so insert Braun Strowman. Another case of Dan, as you said before, you know, someone who's going to get that big moment. It should be done right in front of a crowd, you know, and this was the right platform. It was the right match. It was for the title. However... It was just kind of a plan C, you know, to a plan A that, you know, that they planned for, but then changed, and then they got changed again, you know, beyond their control. Match was basically, I think, what everybody was waiting for it to be. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. Like, okay, like, we've seen these matches for the last five, six, seven years, where you have your two big guys, they just hit each other with, like, their best moves slash finishers and then it's like all right it's over imagine having seen this like back in the day like imagine wrestlemania 6 with the warrior and hulk hogan it's just oh uh body slam versus leg drop for five minutes i don't think anyone would have thought in 1990 like oh this is what we're gonna see in 30 years. It's going to be great. I'm, I'm sure it would have been like, what the hell did I just spend all my money on back then? Now you can pull something like this off and it just makes for like, okay, well, like Dan said, you, you, you have the same two people pulling off the same match, either if it originally was going to be in one show, later on in the night, or like it is, oh, he did this. They did this last night. We're gonna see it tomorrow night. And congrats to Braun. 
Uh, I'm just going to jump right into the final match, which is match of the night. The Boneyard match between AJ Styles versus the now 25-2 and two, um, record holder Undertaker. Uh, I want to kick it off actually to Sean. I want to know how Sean felt about this match. <laughs> Um, I indirectly nicknamed this match the stupidest, greatest thing, um, ever. Um, I don't think anybody was expecting, um, what we, like, what we got. I, I was expecting, you know, Dead Man Undertaker. Um, but man, when that biker, you know, when that motorcycle came in and I was like, here we go. This is not going to be your traditional Dead Man gimmick that we've seen over the last decade. This was great. Like, we were literally watching a scene, like, the, the climactic moment from a movie is what this was. Great production value, very entertaining, very convincing. Um, honestly, people who go, oh, like, you know, what the hell happened, you know, this wouldn't happen in the Attitude Era. Screw that. Like, I, I, at this point, I don't care anymore. You know what? It's not the Attitude Era anymore. It's the Reality Era. This is how we do things now. I enjoyed the hell out of this, and I've watched it twice since then. It's just an all-around... It's fun. Like, if you're feeling down, I would literally put this on. It's bound to get a smile on your face. Great stuff. I loved it. I think that if you were ever going to do something like this, this is the, the perfect time for it, because um, you don't want to oversaturate these, for lack of a better term, overproduced segments. But no, the, the video quality, the, the, the duration, the thoughtfulness, pretty much everything out, outside of the, the rubber ham uh, was great for, for this match. Um, I, I, I feel like you could have done without the little, ha- the little arm sticking out of the grave. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, great match, great action. Uh, they, it was very well structured because even you had sort of that moment when all the when, when the the OC shows up and they come out with all those weird druid people and the Undertaker picks those guys off one by one. It had a feel of like a John Wick type of movie. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I, I thought everything was great about this match, like m- minus the rubber hat. <laughs> uh, no, like the production value, the whole concept. Uh, the idea behind it, I mean, the, the, you're adding on to the story. Like, you're building even further than what you normally do with the build-up in an arena. Like, you're, you're going above and beyond that now. And, you know, the whole element of, like, adding that, uh, like, the graveyard, the whole house where, like, what was it, uh, gallows and... Um, AJ both got thrown off of. Yeah. Like, it, it, it adds more to it. And and the whole thing, like, AJ was selling it. He he was, like, all in on it, like, by being thrown off the house, being kicked into the grave. Like, you, you believed in, like, oh, God, like, what did I get myself into? Like, this was the wrong decision I made. And the only... Other than the rubber hand, the only other thing I kind of thought corny that it was already pre-planned, it was AJ's grave when when Undertaker removes the mesh off the yeah. top of the grave. But I liked it. I, overall, like I, like I said, this was the, the match of the night for night one. Um, you know, and there was a thing, and this is why I believe Matt Hardy was wanting to leave the WWE is because at one point, you know, he wanted to introduce these kinds of matches. Obviously not for every single feud, but, like, every once in a while. So now with the situation we have with the world going on, these kinds of matches make more sense to have now. You know, Kamish, I was just going to make a comment about that. You know, every single WrestleMania, as corny as it sounds, you want to make it different. You don't want it to parallel, you know, a previous WrestleMania. And I think that they took full advantage of going, hey, you know what, this year we can kind of play around with post-production as opposed to just having, you know, two guys in the middle of the ring. Why don't we really have fun with this? And like, as you will see from the, you know, the second match, you know, from night two uh, between John and The Fiend, 
they really went in that direction where it's like, guys, like we have the opportunity to create magic here. Let's do it because, you know, once the, the uh, you know, we're allowed to have audiences again, we're probably not going to be able to do this. You know, people are going to want to see live action in the middle of the ring. So you're not going to be able to do this. So, yeah. you know, I think it was taking advantage and making this WrestleMania will be unique, you know, for the Boneyard match, for the the Fire, Firefly Funhouse match. You know, it's like there was good stuff in the ring and outside of the ring. Yeah, and I mean, my, my only comment is they, they could have... Um done the they could have done the AJ Styles reveal in a more impact way because of the fact that it was pre-filmed if they had shown like the blank uh tombstone or something and then at the end did the the bait and swap then I think that would have been more impactful than just yeah here's a tombstone we got some ivy growing on it ah I got you it was AJ's the whole time <laughs> Exactly. Movie magic. <laughs> yeah, but so there we are. We got through night one, and let's take it over to night two. Go ahead, Dan. All right, join us tomorrow for part. Oh wait, we're doing it right now. Okay. <laughs> so I just want to start. I'm I'm gonna breeze through this real quick. We can just get our uh, our quick thoughts in on it. But the Liv Morgan uh, Natalia match. Liv Liv's been impressing the last couple matches yep. she's had. Been- she she's surprisingly skilled. Like I, she, technically sound, um, seems to to have a decent understanding of ring psychology for somebody you wouldn't think does. But yeah, yeah that was a pretty good match for six six and a half minutes. Not gonna lie, I didn't have a chance to check it out, but you know, Liv and you know yeah. Natalia, you know, I'm pretty sure it was a good match. Yeah, it's worth it. And then to have that followed up by her versus Asuka, uh, also a pretty decent match. So um, yeah. watch out for Liv. Because Liv is life. That's true. But, you know, it's not life. Charlotte Flair defeated Rhea Ripley by submission. By submission. By submission. By submission for the NXT Women's Championship in 20 minutes and 30 seconds. Wait, wait, wait a second. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me check something. Okay, I have a therapy appointment tomorrow. Okay, we're all good. Go ahead. Do you mind if I come along? Yes. Um, is there room for a third? I mean, the Who's the third is... man? So I'm going to chime in on this real quick because I was on the, when I was navigating to the site, to the, this page, um, there's two things floating around. One is uh, that Charlotte was given the belt simply to increase NXT ratings. And the other thing was suggesting that Rhea's work visa may have expired, and so that might have contributed to why she uh, had to drop the belt. Uh, Okay, I I, I think I'm going to take the reins on this. (laughs) uh, Okay, but the whole NXT thing, I, I heard that too, and... Do we really need her to really boost the ratings because Finn isn't boosting the ratings himself? Well, I mean, the other thing about that is I don't remember. I think it was one of you guys said it, but does she have to have the title to be on NXT? That was me. That was me. You could just move her over and she could just be on the show and she didn't have to beat Rhea. (laughs) Thank you. But it, it's it's Blonde Cena. I mean, it, it's it's the daughter to to Ric Flair. I mean, it's not, that, it's not like Triple H can't not say no to Rick, or can he? Uh, can, can we can we send Charlotte through a Firefly Funhouse match? Oh dear God, she won't survive. Sean, uh, yeah, Sean, what do you have to say? Um, I told you guys that if Charlotte won this match, I'm done with Charlotte. There we go. Uh, I'm going to keep it PG. Um, Dan, I think that you brought up the most valid point that this was the only way 
to cement Rhea as your number one player um, in regards to the women's division. Because I sort of think back and I'm like, you know, Rhea comes in. Um, they said, oh, Shayna is undefeated, you know, uh, or not undefeated, but she's got the NXT championship. No one can beat her. Boom. Rhea comes in in convincing fashion and takes the belt. We go to Survivor Series. You know, Rhea is the last woman standing. Then you lead all the way into WrestleMania. It's like, well, you know, she's picking up some good momentum. The fans love her. They can relate to her. Well, how do you cap it all off? You give her this big win over Charlotte. Um, And I honestly thought that, you know, after Rhea wins, maybe Charlotte could go on a vacation. Just take some time off, recharge her batteries, you know, and just, you know, be away for a while. Um, But no, uh, you know, let's give her 22 minutes. Let's, you know, let her slap on the STF. I mean, the figure eight lock. And, you know, let's just screw momentum, screw trying to elevate other people. Let's just give it to Charlotte because we have a record to beat. Um, She's not trying to be like her father. She's trying to be her own gimmick. Um, (laughs) And, yeah, that shouldn't piss anybody off. How how many championships does her father have? Well, it's 16, but at one time in an article they said it's actually like 21, but they're not counting some promotions or whatever. So it's 16. Yeah, WWE's count is 16. Okay. So she's now five away from tying, six away from breaking it. Something just crossed my mind. If we can go to John Cena for one second. Oh, God. From 2005 to 2016, that's 11 years. So John Cena... His base was kind of penciled in to be your Charlotte, where they're like, oh, he's going to reach, you know, 16. I believe he's a 15-time champion at this point, or did he Did he reach 16? I was John Cena now tied with Ric Flair for the most world title victories in uh, WWE okay. history with 16. Okay. So, what, for a second, I look at it, I'm like, you know what, 11 years, sure, I'll take it. But Charlotte has only been how many years? Yeah, I'm. I'm just like, I'm being a little uh, passive aggressive. It's because I'm trying to not blow a gasket, but it's it's really pathetic. Like the whole BS of oh, we're trying to elevate the next crop of talent. No, you're not. You're you're trying well, to keep them keep them down. You know it's okay. So I, I want to know what Dan thinks of all this. I mean, I I agree. I think that spe- specifically. Uh, going the route to a submission victory over Rhea, not the way to do it. If you had, like, like I would have rather that it be, if you're going to give him 20 minutes, have it be such a slugfest that something happens where Rhea is incapacitated by something. Don't have you, or, or even the, the, the stupid move, figure eight, even the figure eight, let her pass out from the pain and that's what makes her lose. Don't have her tap. So would you have had her pull in Austin? If she had to lose, yeah. Okay. I I would have. I she should have won. Let me go on the record saying Rhea should have won this match. I second oh, no, that. I, I I think we're all in agreement. Like I even told you guys as soon as Shot was like checked out, she ruined my perfect picks. Yeah. Like as soon as night two started and we saw Rhea tap out, I'm like this. Chick ruined my fucking picks. Like, sorry for cursing, but, like, I had everyone picked down to, like, almost the perfected, like, amount of wins. But then here we go, like, oh, we're going to give Charlotte the bell. Ah, oh, well, that's you then. Yeah, um, I'm just going to leave it at this. I'm done with Charlotte, and what that means is I have no further comment on her next match, her next rival, her next whatever. She's there um, until further notice, if I change my mind. But um, I'm done with Charlotte. Like, that's it. You can't keep doing this, you know. And apparently you're, quote-unquote, unhappy with your position. Really? You're unhappy? Yeah, sure. Well, real quick, let, let me try and pull this up. 
Um, because I know that they have the number one contenders ladder match for the for the women. Mia Yim, uh, Chelsea okay. Green, okay. Uh, uh, Tegan Knox, uh, Eo. All right. Ooh. Candice. Yeah. Oh, I think it's Dakota. I think Dakota won the le- the, the the second chance thing. That would be interesting. It would be between Eo and Dakota. Yep. I think either of those matches would be good, but I I don't think that we should have had to make that make this uh, make this decision. <laughs> For the record, I was hoping that Bianca would go into an excellent feud with Rhea because I know they would do like one offs, but like I would I would want to see like a full blown feud between these two. But then she went to the main roster the night of Mania, so yeah, and she oh. came back on Raw. Alistair Black, Bobby Lashley, Bobby with Lana. Don't you mean Jax? Oh yeah, Jax. More combat. <laughs> um, uh, Alistair Black picks up the win with the Black Mass as Bobby Lashley puts him down to spear him instead of hitting the Dominator, and Bobby takes the foot to the mouth. It sounds like what the hell? Why are you listening to her, Dan? Why? Would you listen to Lana? Why not? Um, <laughs> I, I don't mean to interrupt, but can we say that Lana's character has taken a, a downward spiral within the last few years? Oh, for sure. I think that wedding was the icing on the cake. <laughs> Get it? Because there was a cake there? Get it? Um, I from, think From Lana's failure was born Liv Morgan. It, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Dan, but even that died a horrible death. Like, they have these interesting vignettes, you know, of her in, the, like, the bathtub or in the bathroom, and it's like, I'm going to show you my real self. And it's like, okay, you bring her back, and you're going for this angle where... Pseudo-lesbian storyline. So I'm sorry. Like, not only Lana, but Liv Morgan's push has been, like, a spark here, you know, and... Nah. But I think, I think that's why Liv's been trying to put on a performance matches because it's like I'm sure she knows like damn it I had a good build up I could have been put in a different direction I could have been put in the direction of the fiend being sister Abigail at one point but no let's put her in this trashy ass lesbian let's be honest bullshit and out of this it just dies immediately at Royal Rumble and then now Liv has to be like, all right, not only did they shoot my character down, not only did they turn me against my other two sisters, I have to kick people's asses hard now. I mean, to her credit, I, I think that if she had been held off until now, um, I think she would have probably been more successful when she came back because she wouldn't have, uh, she wouldn't have been behind the eight ball from, from the beginning. I, and, she would, and she wouldn't have fallen off going into WrestleMania. I wouldn't mind if she came back the night after Mania. Well, if, then again, Raw is, doesn't really have that impact anymore. But, you know, I wouldn't mind it, you know, if, if everything went accordingly. Like, if we had audiences in the crowd, I wouldn't mind if Liv Morgan came back night after Mania. I think she would have gotten a hell of a pop. Yes, definitely. Oh, yeah. But how do we feel about the match? Um, fine, fine match. Um... Nothing, nothing stellar, but it was okay. I, I thought the match was fine. Like I told you guys, there was absolutely, absolutely no build up because of the whole situation, like the time differences and where Bobby was doing a tour versus where A Lister was given like particular matches against other people. The match itself was great. Don't get me wrong; like it, it, it was a good match. Stupid way to end it, um, but. Unfortunately, Jack just couldn't come through. <laughs> I, I think this is another match that would have benefited from just being on the kickoff show because it would. Have, I, I think that the energy of it up until the, the last moment would have been a good way to lead into a, into a show. Yeah. Ironically, maybe it would have held more weight if this went to the pre-show and the Liv and Natty match made it to the actual card. Just, just swapping, swapping a couple matches. Yeah, I I, so, I I second what you guys said. Yeah, it was a decent match. Nothing that really stands out. You know, it was what it was. 
speaking of standing out, however, uh, standing out, like the relationship between Otis and Mandy, Mandy Rose. Ot- Otis picking up the win over Dolph Ziggler, uh, who entered with Sonya Deville. Where is the story going? There, that, I think that's it's all over. I say. Well, I only say that because you have uh, the quote-unquote Matrix happening in, in all this. Maybe that's going to lead into a feud with Dolph, but I think Otis is, is done with Dolph at this point because he, he got the girl, and we know that uh, it was all it was all a scheme. He's got sunshine on a cloudy day. Um, now on that, if these two go their separate ways, I think that that's that's going to free up uh, that's going to free up Otis to. Uh, we talked about heavy machinery have suddenly picking up Mandy as maybe a valet, and I don't have yes. a problem with that. And then if Dolph and Sonya stay together, together and that leads into the into a feud with this hacker thing, I think that'll be good. I think Sean was the one who mentioned that would be the better route for Mandy right now. Yeah. Well, honestly, Dan, I was going to just say that. Uh, that was actually originally your idea. I remember you brought it up one time and, like, that just works for me. You know, I wouldn't mind if right now Mandy and Otis, you know, they're the fun, happy-go-lucky. Like, yeah, he, she's the valet. He's the wrestler. Okay, everything is good. But then what if we jump into an angle where Mandy actually starts manipulating Otis into actually being this, you know, going from like a fun loving, basically a reverse Brodus Clay, where we go from fun loving, dancing, you know, gyrating to this just this giant of a heel, you know, and Tucker goes, hey, Otis, like, dude, what's going on with you, man? Like, you've changed and, you know. You, you kind of plant the seeds like, yeah, Mandy has been kind of getting inside his head and, you know, being manipulative. You know, I think I think that would that would work out, you know, but we'll just have to see where it goes. But yeah, you know, it's just I don't know. I feel like we focused so much on Mandy and Dolph. And then at the last minute, it's like, yeah, Otis gets the girl. We're cool now, you know. So, yeah, it, 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 it hit the it hit the, the gas in reverse very, very hard. Yes, yes. Alright, so, uh, it was a match. It was a match. Anyway, Otis picks up the win and, and get, <laughs> finally gets his moment in the sun. And Moving I love on. JBL's commentary, by the way, when uh, Mandy kisses Otis. He's like, go to commercial break, go to anything, go to anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move on to the next match then. Something everybody did want to see, and that's Edge versus Randy Orton in that last man standing. I think this was the match that kind of killed my battery. <laughs> <laughs> well, it killed my battery because, like, I had to jump off from you guys for a while. But I got to say, like, when we were watching it, I was just like, okay, everything's good. We're doing a typical last man standing. We're moving around the PC center. Uh, holy shit, why are they coming towards the workout shit? Oh my god, we're not going this direction, we're not doing it, oh my god, we're doing it, and now we've just pissed off a lot of people. Um, Randy Orton trying to hang Edge with the, uh, uh, the, the at, workout strap. Apparently, that's being called the Stevie Richards spot, because it actually oh, pissed, no. yeah, because it pissed off, like, not that it pissed off, but like, it, a lot of people started kind of questioning, like, ooh, like... Let's let's be careful with this, especially since we recently got the Dark Side of the Ring documentary. It's like, okay, dude, easy, you know. We're we're kind of. No, but that's the thing. It actually did piss off some superstars that watched it and that had watched the documentary. They're like, wow, you guys went this far to put that spot in there. Edge and Randy probably thought, all right, this would be just, just something brutal that, like, you know, I'm being, you know, the apex predator. You know, you're you're trying to like kick my ass too, and I'm sure them looking back at it like, oh shit, this just happened. Yeah, I, I I'm I'm not that concerned about it. I don't think anybody should be that bent out of shape about it. I understand, but I don't think that they should be. Um, thirty six minutes. The match goes all over the place. Ultimately, ends on top of a semi truck. Uh, <laughs> We were expecting some, uh, I think we were expecting a couple of uh, bigger spots to happen, but obviously, you know, Edge, probably still a little fragile. I know he recently said 
you're going to see me not doing certain things that I used to do. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't fault him. I'm not, I'm never going to hold that against him. I, uh, having him back is a pleasure. Yes. But, uh, yeah, no, it, it was, this was a solid match. And I think that it, it was decent storytelling and Ed, edge, I think in his time away, learned a lot about acting that's going to make his selling and his performances a lot more genuine. Very quick question. Have you guys had a chance to check out his uh, 24 documentary? No, I have have not watched it yet. I have watched Uh, it, so I think that you and I, Kamish, can agree to your point, Dan. I think that's exactly what it is because he touches on that, the whole acting and, you know, kind of being a little bit more in tune about stuff like that. So I think definitely that's going to help him to his benefit. Because he stated himself that knowing he's on the three-year deal for what he was offered, that regardless of the work he puts in, knowing it's part-time work now, that he's going to put a lot more into what he wants to do in regards to like his matches, his promos, anything in particular. And, and right now, I'm sure... like. Minus the whole Stevie Richards spot, everyone's wondering, oh, what's next for him? Where are we going to see Edge again? Who is he going to like come after, or what's he going after next? And the whole thing of you know his acting classes for the last nine years, him and like all these roles he took on, he's going to craft his his like final three years. I'm assuming this is going to be it. Yeah. Like after yeah. these next three years, he's done for sure. But um, I would like to like enjoy the final years he has because after nine years away and all of a sudden like you can go again, I, I would be scared of him trying to do the old shit he used to do. Yeah, he, he doesn't have to. And and speaking to the relevance of uh, his performances to me, my observations. You saw the moment right after the match ended where he, he was like still looking at Rand, Randy tenderly yeah, because they have that history and it's few and far between. You see moments like that with these performers because sure, some of them understand the ideas, but they don't really feel them. And then you had the in-ring promo that he cut that where he was, when he accepted the challenge or he issued the challenge, uh, I actually, as a performer, was listening to it thinking, geez, he's he's hitting all these key points. How could I turn this into an actual monologue? Mm-hmm. So I thought that was a really well-done promo, and Edge has been doing great so far. Yeah, you know, I think that, well, like I mentioned before, you know, trying to make this WrestleMania unique, you know, because when you think of Last Man Standing matches, you don't think about two guys fighting in the gym, you know? But I think that this year it was a case of, hey, well, how do we take advantage of what we have? You know, and they get full access to the performance center and make their way to the parking lot on top of a semi. I think you made the comment down look like something out of a WWE 2K. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think excellent match. Uh, like I said, with the Becky and Shayna match, this is like, that's what, you know, that match should have been. You know, two, of the, like, you, because you saw at the end, these two were gone. Like, they were exhausted, you know, and they gave you everything that they had. Like, talking about, like, le- they usually say that they left it in the ring, but for this case, I'm going to say that they left it, you know, outside of the ring. Um, these, these guys, like, did everything that they can possibly do. And I think I made the comment to be gone for nine years not doing this and to and to come at, come back and to immediately have a 36 minute last man standing there it's like oh wow like that's impressive you know and, and edge you know he 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 stood in there with randy and you know they pulled it off there were there was no botches there was no signs of oh like no he can't do it anymore you know like he did it you know to to the best of his degree like he did it and Great match, wonderful match, definitely stands out. All right. Uh, so the next match was six minutes, 20 seconds. The Street Profits defeated Angel Garza and Austin Theory with Zelina Vega. Bathroom break, anyone? More, more or less. Yeah. Not to say that these guys aren't tal- talented, I just didn't care. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Street Profit, they're, they're decent characters. Garza and Theory aren't. Uh, 
anytime Angel Garza is cutting a promo, I have I I literally don't don't have any investment in him at all. Um, it just it, it didn't it didn't even need to happen. I I think we've had WrestleManias before where we don't have a tag team match on there. This would have been one of those years that it was fine. Yeah. Yep. Any other thoughts? That's it. Nope. Perfect. Fatal Five Way Elimination Match. Let's Bailey, talk up, about this. Picking up the win over Lacey Evans, Naomi, Sasha Banks, and Tamina. I believe the elimination order was Tamina, Naomi, Banks, Evans. Yes. Yep. 19 minutes, 20 seconds. Go. I'm going to say, and I'm going to jump in on this, because this was, in my personal opinion, two things should have happened. One, this should have propelled Lacey into championship level. The belt should have been hers. And two, we finally, after years and years of speculation and wondering when they're going to pull the trigger on this, Banks versus Bailey. Did we get any of that? Hell no. Why? Like, Dan? Why? Why like, didn't we get it? Like, what was so wrong if, like, Bailey lost what she quote unquote claims has been the best run of her career to Lacey? What would have been wrong with that? Like, honestly. And then, why couldn't we just see Sasha, instead of helping Bailey retain, turn on Bailey finally? I, I agree. I think that this would have been a great time to put Lacey over. Um, you had her catch Sasha with that w- woman's right, and I think that if she had also overcome Bailey, it would have it would have cemented their their feud, the three of them, and just put uh, put the end to it. Or worst case, you could have got t- carried this into the next month, and you could have had Bailey come for the the title at the next show, or do a triple threat match. Um, but that's when I would have had uh, Sasha turn on Bailey. You know, I brought up the idea because um, I know Dan. Before you've said that WrestleMania is essentially supposed to be like ending of the season, and Monday Night Raw is supposed to be the beginning of the new season. Yeah. Um, I thought you know in this match you could have ignited two storylines. Number one is giving Lacey the championship because it's well-deserved. She's improved so much since, you know, last year at this time. So you. Um, you put the championship on Lacey, and so she starts having her feud with the title, feuding with anybody that's not Bailey or Banks. And then you have Sasha turn on Bailey, and this ignites, you know, Bailey versus Banks. So essentially, after your WrestleMania, you have two new things that you could start doing. But once again, much like, you know, trying to put the Universal Championship on Roman, no, let's, let's, let's hold it off. Let's hold it off. Let's hold it off. Um, yeah, like the match wasn't bad, but it just, it made no sense. Like knowing Sasha Banks' character, it made no sense. Like, that's not what the boss does. She doesn't help Bailey win at the show of shows. Like, are you kidding me? So, yeah, but... Good. To to add in, I'm sorry, but I honestly, I was expecting, as soon as Sasha gets eliminated, like, with that woman's right, like, she's pissed, she, she doesn't know what to do, like, she leaves, and then you see her, I didn't even see her come back. It was a surprise when she hit, uh, I forgot what the move was on, uh, backstabber, the backstabber on Evans. If I had seen the backstabber hit on Bailey out of nowhere, kind of like an RKO out of nowhere, I would have been like, holy shit. And, and, and it would have been an accurate representation of its name. Um, and I only count. It, I'm sorry to cut you off. It, it, I would just say it would show that this is what Sasha wanted. She took her time off. She came back. She did her heel turn. And she still stuck to being a heel. Now my, my only counterpoint to the whole thing is, like, I, I, I agree that that would have been a good way to go at Mania had they built up to it better. 
I felt like it was a little weak, the, the, the planting of the seeds for Sasha to turn on Bailey, which is why I don't think they did it just yet. It's a very confusing situation, like, again, with the circumstance of everything that's happened. It's like, they should be building on these storylines, but they're not. So when it comes time to pull the trigger on something, it's like, well, do we? Don't we? Should we? Do we have to? Is it necessary? Is it right? Um, and I, I also made the comment to you, Dan, because, Kamish, I believe you had still left us at this point. Um, where when Banks was eliminated, she was still at ringside laying on the floor. And I made the observation, I'm like, Dan, I smell a face turn coming, but then we got something that wasn't that. So, yeah, eh, whatever. Overall, decent match, though. Yeah. Yeah. So... We got two and a half matches, and I'll address the half match uh, when we get there. But we got two and a half matches left to discuss. So let's move into night two's boneyard match in the form of the Firefly Funhouse. Here we go. The Fiend defeats John Cena after taking him down uh, the Tunnel of Cena. To begin it, and to go from the beginning to the end of it, just like Titus O'Neil's reaction at, at first watch. It's an entire what the f the whole time. I saw I saw it described online as the equivalent of the Willy Wonka uh, boat scene. Oh Jesus! <laughs> Where it's just sort of an acid trip, which eh, it it kind of was. <laughs> but the thing is, like, I think we tried discussing it after the whole event that. It needs like a couple rewatches to really make sense of everything, and like I even had to watch it like a couple for a couple of days now. I'm just like, okay, well, I get where we were going with it. I wonder who out of the three because it was between Bray, John, and uh, Bruce Pritchard who came up with the idea of this match, and I'm wondering. Why was John so willing to put all that out there? Like, because maybe he's finally bought into the idea, like, damn, I really did do all that I did. And even then, like, I think my favorite segment out of that whole match was the NWO thing. <laughs> yeah. But, like, I... I, I I don't, if you guys want to explain your feelings for it, go, go for it, because wow. Go ahead, Sean. Um, so I think naturally my first reaction was like, what the hell are we watching? Because again, we're some, we're, we, we, we were going into this thing expecting an AJ Styles and Undertaker Boneyard-esque type of thing. Where they're both in the funhouse, and then they start using whatever objects they can get their hands on. And then eventually someone walks away the winner. Um, and then we start seeing, you know, essentially a package video kind of put together, um, going through a timeline of kind of Cena's key moments. And I'll tell you this, um, I told Kamish this last night, Dan, when we were talking, and I'm going to ask you the same question. How would you feel if I told you that in every storyline that the fiend has been in, he has actually been the good guy? <laughs> And let me shed some light on what I'm trying to tell you. So, naturally in this match, you know, the regular Bray Wyatt before, you know, WrestleMania would tell John, like, I'm going to show you, like, what you really need to know. Like, you know, he said, you know, the Firefly Funhouse is a place that we go to where we have our insecurities and, you know, but there comes to a time where those insecurities, they open up and they reveal the true, our true selves. I look at it as Bray Wyatt uses the regular Bray Wyatt to try to explain to his opponents, hey, you're not what you say you are. And when his opponents and the rest of the world don't believe him or don't listen, Bray Wyatt uses an evil force, a.k.a. the Fiend, to get that point across. Much like this match, where Bray Wyatt, if you notice, the whole match is regular Bray Wyatt. Up until when Cena realizes that, oh, Bray Wyatt is right, who comes out? The Fiend. <laughs> exactly. 
And, you know, I looked at, you know, his feud with Seth Rollins and Daniel Bryan, and I'm like, you know, what he was telling Seth, that you're not really who you claim to be. What happened with Seth? He became the Monday Night Messiah. With Daniel, he's like, you know, Daniel, you're not that Yes Movement guy anymore. So what did he do? He, quote-unquote, ripped off his hair, but Daniel Bryan obviously shaved, taking away that GOAT identity of, you're not the Yes Movement leader anymore, you're this new Daniel Bryan. So I looked at it as this was The Fiend's way of putting a stamp of I'm not really the bad guy here. I just use darker methods to get the truth out of people. So that's just that's where that's my opinion. That's how I see it. Very interesting video package. Um, The fact that Cena was willing to do this is amazing. But I think that I told I've told the both of you. This is his point in his career where he's finally giving back. So that's those are my sentiments. I thought I, I thought it was uh, very unique. I thought it uh, told a good story. I I mentioned that during the first viewing, partially because I had you guys on the on what what, what were we using Google Duos? Yes. Um, I was a little distracted, so I missed the the part where they zoom in on John while he's in the Sister Abigail pose. Yeah. And uh, it's repeating his dialogue saying, this is the end of the most overhyped, overprivileged WWE superstar of all time. But who's he really talking about? It, it indicates himself. Exactly. So I thought, uh, I thought that it, it was well well done i think they they put a lot of effort into it and the people involved uh re- seemed to really care like like if you think about it like okay we, we got like bray used all the mind games of like okay i'm gonna expose you for first your biggest failure where you could have been fired and john cena would have never existed i'm gonna show the world what everyone thought of you which was the whole thing of like him and Bray cutting like that 80s, 90s Saturday Night Main Event uh, promo. It's like all you're going to be is just another one of like McMahon's big guys. Hulk Hogan. Yeah. To repeat WrestleMania 30, it's like I'm giving you the opportunity to relive what you should have done. You should have done this. And you see Cena this time swing at him. And and that and that's what cut into the whole NWO thing because it's like that would have been like another Hulk Hogan esque moment where it's like you did what no one would ever think you would ever do, which was turn heel. And and I think the whole psychology of the match is is what I like the most out of all this because it it just made for a better match. Yeah, I was expecting more of the same thing with the. Boneyard S type match where it's like we see more of the fun house, we see how goofy and demonic it might really be, but Yeah, I think once again I go back to my point of before, take advantage of the post production that you have. Because maybe at WrestleMania thirty seven we have a live audience again and, and you can't do that. You can't play a thirty minute package video and go, Here's your match, you know, like people are gonna riot. This is where we get to the ultimate main event. This is the match and a half I was talking about because apparently, immediately after the match, uh, Big Show came out and challenged Drew to a match. So that's the second portion of this. <laughs> so Drew, Drew McIntyre defeats Brock Lesnar with Paul Heyman for the WWE Championship in four minutes and thirty-five seconds. Oh Jesus! Which is the second shortest match on the actual card. Beaten only by, get this, the other world title match. Oh, God. <laughs> if, I can, if I can just put something into perspective for you guys, and, I, and I'm sorry I have to go back to this, that is half the time that Shayna and Becky got, just to put uh, it into perspective for you. This was, this was built up. Drew was built up. This was supposed to be his ultimate coronation uh, of redemption, coming from 3MB to fire to this. Yeah, I, I I was fully behind Drew. I think he's I th- I still think he deserved the win. I feel bad that he didn't get the true WrestleMania moment. That we talked about how Brock hits the first F five one count, hits the second F five. Okay, so that's two F fives. Gets the two count. So by math stand standards, the third F five should have been the three count, but yeah. it wasn't. 
Meanwhile, Drew hits three Claymore kicks, and that's what gets him the win. Four. But he, I'm saying in the second half, because he hits oh, okay. the one immediately, but then he right. hits him three more times, and that's when he wins. Right, yeah. Yeah, Drew, Drew gets, his, uh, gets his win, and he poses, poses on, the, on the turnbuckle. What are your thoughts? I think, again, like, this is what we were expecting. Um, glad that Drew got his moment, but unfortunately not not a hundred percent the circumstance that we wanted him to get it in. Like you obviously wanted the live crowd to cheer and pop. Um, Drew can point at the camera and tell everybody, thank you. And you know, everybody's in my heart and that's, that's all great, but it's, it's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be authentic, you know? So, yeah, he doesn't get that. Uh, what do you call it? He doesn't get the triple H moment at 17. He doesn't get the Shawn Michaels WrestleMania 12 moment. He doesn't get the Rey Mysterio at 22 moment. Like, you know, when you see someone who they built up, like, you put them through the, like, the hero's journey story. Yeah. And at Mania, it's the coronation, like you said, and it's like, here's the belt. You earned it. Go show the world how happy you are. Like, I feel bad that Drew got robbed of this because of the world's unfortunate circumstance of what's going on. And it's like, yeah, the whole world can cheer him on via, like, the internet, but it still doesn't have that same impact. Now, here, here's a thought. Do we give him the, this, this win so that he gets the win because we already built him up as the guy who was going to beat Lesnar and then have him lose the belt before SummerSlam and give him his, his real coronation at SummerSlam? To give him a moment? I would yeah. say yes. Because I, I think that if he if if they give him another shot at SummerSlam to regain the belt off of some somebody imposing, it's gotta be. Um and he you build it up properly as if it was WrestleMania, I think he'll get the same pop he would have. So you so what you're saying is it has to be at the next big pay per view. Correct. I, I you can't do it at like a at, at a at a Money in the Bank or a Battleground or a Super Showdown, you got to do it at one of the big one of the big four or really one of the big two. Because I would think that would make more sense and it would be more fair to Drew. I mean, yeah, I'm sure Vince is like willing to do it, but at the same time, it's like you kind of have to do it for the man. Like, Jesus, I, I also- fired him and you brought him back. I also think this match would have gone longer if there had been a crowd. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of brought up that point that who wins and loses probably would have stayed the same, but the structuring of half these matches would have been completely different had there been a crowd. Um, and again, I know we talk about like it being out of their control, you know, the circumstance of the world, but... I often question, I'm like, you know, if you had just postponed it for at least a month or two, I don't know, you know, maybe everything would have gone back to normal, you could have done WrestleMania in May or June, but yeah, I don't know, it's... Now, 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 and I know we've talked about that, but the, the flip side of that is... Do you do you continue building these feuds for another two months? I don't think it would have the same impact. Yeah, I, I think if some of these would have burned out. Um, I think Rhea and Charlotte would have lost its luster. I think uh, Edge and Randy would have lost its uh, would lost a little bit of its fire. Um, Shayna, right, yeah, Becky and Shayna. I think all the big matches. If we had burned them out for two more months before ultimately getting to WrestleMania, I don't think that any of them would have had the same uh, weight. Well, when you look at it, if I'm, I hope I'm not mistaken when I say this, but I think three of yesterday's matches on Raw was a wrestler versus a local competitor. Yeah, I, I, I skipped literally everything except the Nia Jax match, I think. The Nia and Liv. Which, by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to already say this. We talked about it before. You bring Nia back, do not have her talk. But they're, just, they're, they're doing the same thing. Like, 
there's no change. I've noticed that when someone, you know, has an injury and comes back, you think, okay, clean slate, fresh start, and it's like, nope, we're going to do the same old song and dance. I mean, I'm not going to put too much stock in it. I would say let's give it another week before we jump to conclusions, but I'm not holding my breath. Um, but she she's borrowing the Rampage, so she's got a different finisher now. Well, okay, to... I kind of read up on that. I so did too. Technically, the rampage was given to her. Yep. But yeah, because Paige can't do it anymore. <laughs> well, not just that, but Paige said it was okay for her to have it. Yes. He said someone no, like Naya has earned the right to use my move. Yeah, no, I'm aware. And and they're still friends, so. I, I actually... Kind of, okay. I, I kind of agree with Sean. Like, I would have loved to bring back Naya... As this, like, quiet, brute force, you know, let me earn my way up to a championship for a while. Maybe revisit the Becky versus Nia feud that could have happened. But, like, don't have Nia talk about it. Just have her, like, try to be, like, attacking and try to dominate over Becky. I have... Yeah, like, let, like, let Becky carry the feud. I know that we're kind of tangenting off of Mania for one second, but I this, this kind of ran through my mind today, and I kind of want to... I want to bring it up and see what you guys think. So, seeing how she borrowed Paige's move, how would you guys feel if Nia came back as that brute force, silent, just kind of, you know, soft-spoken, actions speak louder than words type of thing, and Paige became her manager, like her mouthpiece? I I, I don't have a problem with that. I know Paige was doing the whole thing there for the five-on-five match, so... It keeps her on on television, and she's still she's still a, a, a she's an intelligent professional wrestler. Yes. Uh, so I think that having her there, especially in a situation like that, uh, would definitely be beneficial for those involved. Agreed. Yeah, uh, I, I I can agree with it. But let's wrap the, let's wrap this up by jumping back real quick and talking about Drew and the and the Big Show in that dark match. Uh, WWE Championship match. Where do we see this all going? Because you had Big Show come out and immediately challenge him. Drew said, there's nothing you can say that'll make me fight you. Then Big Show hits him. I think he slaps him in the face. <laughs> this, is, this is not even one of those situations where it's like they were trying to give the live attendance, like the live audience, like a gem because there was no audience. So... I don't really know where they're going with this. I like the idea. That would have maybe been like if there was an actual, like if Raw was was Raw um, and if we had an audience. I wouldn't mind if Drew McIntyre started off his reign like defeating the Big Show in, in a convincing match because that would cement him as like, oh, like this guy, because he's, he's really a monster. Like when you think about it, like Drew measures up. Um, so... I like it, but then again, I wouldn't want him falling into the act of, oh, every part-timer that you can get your hands on, have Drew challenge for the championship, or have Drew defend the championship, you know? Yeah. Uh, I would like to think it would have been better if the Big Show came to on Raw, yeah. and Drew came out on Raw, shot the promo, like, uh, now it's been like, oh, it's 24 hours, I won the belt, you know, I'm... Um, you know, you're, whatever you said. The only thing I would change is I would make Drew not be as much of a babyface mouthpiece because I'm trying to buy into this, like, okay, he, he fought for what he wanted. You know, maybe he should still kind of be, like, that Scottish psychopath, but, like, let him be in control of his own promos. Because at this point, I don't want him to be given the Kofi Kingston route. Yeah. Where it's like you tame him down from who he is. Like, you know, like you should allow him the freedom to cut his own promos and do his own thing as that, like, crazy bastard that you want to see him fight whoever wants to come across his way. Yeah. I, I like that it, it was the big show to immediately be like, all right, you, you think you're, you can defeat anybody? Well, you took that one big guy that doesn't mean shit. Let's see what you can do against me. I just don't like that it had to be still on WrestleMania. Yeah, it should have been a match for Raw. 
it felt weird. The only reason I could think they, they did it that way was because that maybe Big Show was just at, he was at the WrestleMania tapings and he wasn't going to be around for whenever they recorded Monday uh, Monday's Raw. Yeah. But either way, it's weird. Um, as for what it means in the long term, um, I, I feel like they're going to try and keep him with the big guys for, for a minute. Um, and I don't have a problem with them painting him as the, the, this tough guy. I'm willing to fight anybody type of champion because I think that that's how he should be billed. Um, and I think he has to adjust his personality based on who it is. Like you saw, he was trying to be humble. He was trying to say, I'm not going to fight you. I just got done with a match and then he got hit and then he got serious. So I think that, uh, I think he's he's warming up to this new personality, and I, I'm excited to see where it goes. Um, and I I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward to when we get to see WWE champion Drew McIntyre in front of a live audience again. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna bring up a point that you each respectfully made. Um, first thing, Kamish, what you said about him being a babyface. I think I mentioned this a few times. The second he wins the championship, I don't want to see, you know, white meat baby face Drew McIntyre. You know, I want to see sort of semi-anti-hero, borderline, you know, psychopath Drew McIntyre as the WWE champion. Um, and to go back to your point, Dan, I think that that's exactly what they should do, you know. Because I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to see Drew versus Ricochet. I don't want to see Drew versus... <laughs> You know, small guys. I want to see Drew versus the Samoa Joes. I want to see Drew versus, uh, I don't know, you know, anybody who... What was that? Kevin Owens. I'll take it. I'll take it. But I don't... I'm okay with some of the middle guys. Like, I wouldn't have a problem seeing, like, an Andrade versus Drew at some point. But, yeah, some of the smaller guys like Ricochet, Angel Garza, keep those guys away from it. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, so that's WrestleMania. So what 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 are your guys' respective uh, letter letter score for the for the whole event? Um, to be very honest, I'm gonna give it a solid B. Um, I think when we were going into this thing, we were expecting it to just be an absolute shit show, if you will. Um, but actually, there was a lot of things that they pulled off very very well. You know, both of the gimmick matches, you know, the Boneyard match, the Firefly Funhouse match, the Kevin and Seth match, the ladder match. Um, There was, I think there is something for everyone in this WrestleMania. So I agree. I would probably, I'd probably give it a B as well. Yeah, that's where I stand. I'm going to go with a B as well, because honestly, for the unique situation it was put into two nights and the whole, like, Thing with the Boneyard and Firefly match, and then the fact I felt like even the the performers were like, "All right, we got to give them a really good show. We have to really try with this. Uh, yeah, it's unique, it's different, but we have to give an A match, even if it's under these terms." And again, there were some spots I know they were recorded where we're like, "Maybe this should have been different." That's why my grade stays at a B. Yeah, not everybody's going to love what happened during these two days, but I respect WWE for giving it a shot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So, yeah, uh, any final comments, guys? That does it for me. I'm good. So, uh, there you go, guys. We just reviewed uh, WrestleMania 36, both nights, 16 matches, what we thought. Leave your guys' thoughts in the comments below. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. Everybody stay safe, stay home, and we will see you all next time.